Barry's all, you good? Yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for coming out on this dreary Sunday um, to the event. Um, I'm Victoria McNulty. I'm the writer in residence at Paisley Book Festival, and I am really looking forward to introducing some of the most cel or two of the most celebrated contemporary writers in Scotland at the moment. It's going to be an absolutely fab night. Um, I'd like to warm up a wee bit, begin and set the tone um, with a wee bit of poetry. Obviously our theme tonight is community stories and respect, really response to the stories mark us theme of the festival. And I was thinking about my community a wee bit, and my community um, in East End of Glasgow has experienced a really rapid change in gentrification over the past probably 30 years, but really accelerated in the past 10 years. So I wrote a while ago, I kind of thought, I thought, what would Eve be like if she was cast out of the Garden of Eden to wander the Calton for eternity? Um, hey, it's not a good thought, really. Um, so, I In the beginning, there was only flesh. Dew and plump and sodium sex, he gave his rib and her a seed, and together they were equals. New digits place mountains of bones and breasts, brows soft and lips wet, fingerprints printing the time and space, a slow breath and stall pace. And as the equinox streamed, the garden grew wild around them, and he turned his heels and he ran. Eve now sits in the Calton bar, I know the a colour glass in this tin pot band, the jukebox some fading shade of deacon blue. She's still and stirring and sodden. This year plods round her ears, you see nothing ever happens here, so she sinks a stout, holds back the tears. Her fingers forming a roll up once feasted, now dry for weather and cheap labour. She recalls it used to be green round here. No green like trees, but emeralds of flags and youth and envy. A commonwealth grey hushes as she slinks out the side door. There's no commonwealth round here. And in the summer, she saw him in the bric-a-brac. The George Best photos, like the one in the loft, his hair all black and soft. And she sees him in the lead mirrors. The spotted spectres of smoke and decay. And she sees them in the vinyl stalls, the style council single and the coal fit wash. She sees them in the floorboards, her feet pound again and again and again. You see, he didn't push her face in the dust, nor shame her, or call her a slut. He didn't shackle her or tame her or slice her or maim her. He just saw the fruit so full and ripe. He was told if he turned his back, the world would let him have it. And so she became Cain, and not able to leave. Lost amongst the hubbub, the artist studios and pop-up pubs, she shed her skin as a private let, strangled the foliage. Now, her hair in a bun, the pub shutters were down, she looked up for her phone, and he stood there in lamplight, all freckled and white as the pumps and glasses clashed around him. And he smelled the drills in Baghdad with airport Ray-Ban sunglasses and Emirates, and Eddie had his backbone bolstered with all that it is to be a soldier, and how being a soldier has made him. And in a sea of rigor boots, he flexed his wings and pulled her through. He said, Eve, I want you, and I'm ready, so will you come with me now? She visioned her fingers being bled yellow with matchsticks, being buried in the sand and pelted with bricks, and how she'd wet blood chain to the toll booth, some fishwife. She was fucked by presidents, indentured and changed. They cut her tongue and buried her name and silenced her in the famine to walk this stretchy, boarded up pubs and single ends with the frail and the bruise beside her, coughing up the sinsy man. And as the gentry built their walls, the years had weathered her bitter. I'm not Eve, she said. Coal in her chest now, burning ashen red with indignation for all that was granted against her, all that they took from her sisters and the time that was not his to take. 
I'm Cain, and I am not able to leave with you, even if I wanted to. Thank you. So, are we ready for the first offer of the night? You just don't fucking sound it. We bit louder. Are you ready for the first offer of the night? God's sake, man. Right, so he is a rapper, a community worker, an author of the up and coming social distance between us. He's the 2018 Orwell Prize winner for the bestseller Poverty Safari. Please welcome to the stage inspiration and provocateur Darren McGarvey. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Victoria. Always so humble when you finish performing. Victoria says thank you at the end of a poem. I say, you may applaud. <laughs> it's amazing how cool something can sound when you say it in a poetry voice. Um, I now wipe the pubic hairs from my keyboard. Um, anyway, I, I thought instead of performing something tonight, uh, given that my headspace is completely occupied with a lot of different work that I'm doing, I, I, I thought that I would read the, the since edited out uh, preface or preface, however you pr pronounce it, uh, of the book that's coming out in May. Um, and, and it was one of the tougher editorial decisions that I made because I think it's pretty strong as a mission statement about the book, but books can become a bit front loaded with stuff and most people just want to get right into a book when they pick it up. So let me know what you think. <clears throat> and I'll do it in two parts obviously because I've got two slots. I'm doing a long preface now, aren't I? It's just like, hurry up. <clears throat> it was at the height of a long hot summer in 2018 in an overbearing corner of central London that my life as a fully paid up member of Britain's lower classes ended abruptly. The morning after winning the Orwell Prize for my, and this is inverted commas by the way, this is not what I think of the book, brutal, harrowing, unflinchingly honest memoir about poverty, it occurred to me that I could for the first time afford to travel home to Glasgow in first class. Upgrading to first class eliminates entirely so many of the discomforts, inconveniences and frustrations associated with a standard train journey and should have felt somewhat exciting. Instead, I was gripped by a sense of hypocrisy. After all, hadn't I made a bit of a name for myself calling out the pampered and comfortable middle classes, insulated as they often are from poverty's unpleasant effects? And first class travel, uh, is first class travel not simply one of the many mechanisms available to them by which they are able to hermetically seal themselves off from the experiences of those further down the food chain. Having walked away from the Royal Society of Arts only the night before, safe in the knowledge that I had secured the medium term prosperity of my young family, and exhausted from being ferried around London for three days, I reasoned that I had earned the right to celebrate my success, that I should treat myself. Travelling an economy for five hours is not the hardest thing in the world to do, but the minimal personal space and seating, which seem tailored to create restlessness and discomfort, become even more unbearable when you know those in the front three carriages of the train suffer no such indignity. Finally, I could experience public transport as they did, rather than resentfully squashed in the train's lower, more congested carriages. Yet the undeniable thrill of feeling I was finally moving up in the world was tinged with a sense of betrayal. I immediately attempted to quieten this nagging resistance by further rationalising my decision. I deserve this. I have worked hard. It would give me time and space to get my work done. Train tickets are already pretty expensive, so what is the difference if I pay a bit more? It will be great research for the book, 
You can do a fashionably meta preface conveying to readers the excruciation of knowing you are on paper at least becoming middle class. As I scrolled manically through the various upgrade options available while checking over my shoulder, worried someone in the cafe would see me like anybody in London cared, I looked and felt guilty, sensing I would soon pass through a crucible from which I would emerge profoundly changed. That success, moderate as it was, had already begun corrupting me. Perhaps I was being hard on myself. It is, after all, completely natural to want to travel in a quieter carriage when you can open a packet of Monster Munch without elbowing someone in the face. It's also totally reasonable to do so if you can afford to. The conflict came not from possessing the means to travel in first class, but from the awareness that most other passengers on the train did not. My conscience bothered me because I knew that by paying more to opt out of the unpleasant standard experience, I would place another wedge between myself and the people I had for years tirelessly attempted to represent in my work, the working class, the poor, and the vulnerable. As I boarded the train, hoping desperately that I would not bump into anyone who knew me and took my place in first class, it became immediately apparent that many of my fellow travellers were not burdened by this tedious internal conflict. They seemed accustomed to commuting in relative comfort. I took my seat, placing my headphones over my ears to block out the chat of a racing mind. My life will never be the same, I thought to myself. Then, perhaps typically, <clears throat> around two hours into the journey, the train drew to a sudden halt. After about ten minutes, when no information was given as to why we had stopped in the middle of nowhere, passengers became agitated. Staff were dispatched to first class to reassure us. The train had become so overcrowded that people from standard class began to filter through. Complimentary water followed, but only for those with first class tickets. It was odd to observe how quickly order on the train was compromised simply by coming to a standstill. After 30 minutes, I was left with no choice but to make the perilous journey to the shop in Coach C, feeling this was a situation only a bag of enamel pulverising Haribo could remedy. The automatic doors closed behind me, leaving me in a no man's land between first class and economy. In front of me, passengers were sitting on the floor outside the toilets. An unpleasant waft of sewage permeated the air. I had visions of being pelted with eggs and tomatoes as I regressed further down the train and entered the first of a succession of overcrowded carriages and what felt like a deleted scene from Children of Men. I had only been travelling in first class for a matter of hours and it appeared that I had already forgotten how awful the rest of the train can be when something goes wrong. Everything seemed lower down, the seats were visibly smaller. The people crammed together, looking stressed and uncomfortable. Bags and cases too big to fit in the designated storage areas were stacked up precariously in whatever space was left beneath tables or behind seats. Exhausted parents bribed young children with chocolate and mobile phones to calm them, while other passengers decided to begin the party early, breaking out beer cans and bottles of wine, much to the frustration of their sober fellows. One man blasted 50 cents, get rich or die trying, from his mobile, wearing no headphones, mouthing every word. Another proclaimed to a distracted friend that he had never seen the big deal about golf, though clearly considered it a big enough deal to annoy everyone in the vicinity by talking loudly about it. The comforts of first class are all well and good, even more so when the train breaks down. But when you've travelled alongside those in the standard carriages and know something of the fuss they can kick up when legitimate frustrations stir and begin to boil over, the complimentary gin does little to calm the dread. I began to worry that, in the end, I might pay rather more than the price on the ticket for a superior seat at the table. Thank you.
Thanks very much for that, Darren. That was fantastic, and a treat actually to hear some new writing. I think we should just move on swiftly eh, to our next author. They are bold and innovative in crafting queer and neurodivergent characters and in, in interesting settings. They are the author of the cult publication Romeo, Vicky Romeo Plus Jewels, and the 2022 Saltire Award book recipient for Book of the Year for duck feet. They are the absolutely wonderful Eli Percy. Please welcome them very welcome. Thank you. God, you can't see it net there. Uh, I'm really excited to be back here again. Um, last year, I was here at Paisley Book Festival. Well, I wasn't, I wasn't physically here. Um, I was at the, um, the online festival, um, and I can report that I got here today without breaking anything, unlike last year. Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to start with something old. Um, I'm going to read a bit from Duck Feet. Um, which, for anyone that doesn't know, was a coming-of-age novel set in Renfrew and Paisley, and it follows a young girl from Renfrew, Kirsty Campbell, as she goes through high school um, from her first to sixth year. We are different pals, um, and it sort of covers stories about bullying, peer pressure, uh, drugs, sexuality. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to um, break with tradition today and I'm going to read from the second part of Duck Feet. I've only ever read this story or part of this story once before to an audience and it was about 10 years ago, so it's a wee bit different from what it was back then. Um, but the reason I'm reading this um, is this story is about um, Wally. Wally was the boy that um, Kirsty um, finds that she, she hears about him before she meets him. He's um, Mad Mental Wally McCoy. His name is on, is on lampposts around Renfrew um, and he's into drinking Bucky at 12 and she's terrified that he's going to batter her. Um, but then she meets him and she thinks he's a really nice boy, actually. Um, so in this story um, they're, they're both 15 so they're in fourth year at high school. So I'm going to just dive in. This story's called Hero. Wally McCoy's a hero. Some lassie in his craft and daft class went and chopped her finger off by accident the other day. It was caused a worry and she managed to get it sewed back on. Whilst everyone in the room was on and saying, Hey, hey look at all the blood, etc, etc. Wally grabbed the finger, run along to the canteen and put it in a cup of ice. It's going to be a big assembly for him tomorrow morning. He's meant to be getting some kind of medal after he did. It was in the Paisley Express what happened, and Wally got his spot he took and was on the front page with his around the lassie who was holding up her bandaged horn. The headline was a cracker, by the way. It said, Schoolboy hero gets his finger out to aid classmate. Suddenly, all the teachers are being nice to Wally. Even our math teacher, Mr. Bueller, who's been saying for ages he's going to get him moved down to Foundy, has been sucking up his arse. Yesterday, during the first period, let him out, get, he let him get you all the compasses. He never even said it when Wally did his usual, Mr. Bueller, can I borrow a ruler? He always does that, and he sends the class into hysterics. Billy, son, said Mr. Bueller, just as we were going out the class. I don't think I've actually ever heard Bueller call him anything other than Mr. McCoy or you, boy. Can you wait behind for a minute? A few folks snigger. Because nobody calls him Billy, and certainly no Billy, son. I walked dead slow down the corridor to English so I could hear what was wig what was going on. I think most other folk had the same idea. What did he say? What did he say? shouted Chris Duffy when Wally came out of the class. Wally rolled his eyes and said, He wanted to tell me how proud he was of me for being a good Samaritan. The assembly was at 10 o'clock this morning. The whole school, even the cleaners and the dinner woman were there. Wally looked dead awkward, especially since his man and dad, nearly all his family were there. And his old man was wearing a suit and said his usual ranger's top and tracky trousers. It was funny seeing all the McCoys in the one room, all dressed up like they were going to court or something. Just as they were about to sit down, Wally's ma tried to spit clean the side of his mouth, and his face was an absolute picture. You could well tell Wally didn't want to be there. He kept shifting about in his seat and looking down at his fingernails. I think he would have went up, though, to get the medal, even just for his family's sake. 
if it hadn't been for Duffy and Mickey O'Rourke and that crowd, pure shouting things. Here comes the hero, shouted Chris Duffy. Hey, Wally, see if I cut both my horns off, he said. Do you think you could keep them in your freezer until after the exams? Hey, Wally, shouted Mickey O'Rourke. My cats get spit stuck in a wheelie bin. Why, come rescue it for us? Wally told them both to bolt. Watch it, your pair of mongs, he said. I'm going to stick you in a wheelie bin. Chris Ross and Chris Russell started saying things like, Going to gauge your autograph, man? And why is him so why sign my pencil case? It's a pure sin for him. It wasn't even that surprising, he said, sack this, and walked out the assembly hall. It's the last day before exam leave, and Harley and my pals are there. Yvonne had the flu and Clicky was at the dentist and Charlene's mad didn't think there was any point in sending her when she could be home babysitting her wee sister. End up it was just me and Smellerman and Willie McCoy that was in math fifth period. And Bueller never even turned up to take the class. Hey Kirsty, said Willie, do you want to just dog it Seth then? I get pure shivers up my back when he said it because I've never skipped school in my puff. Want he? He said. Oh, I don't know, I said. Mon, it's only maths left dangerously. What, what happens if we get caught? Who's going to catch us? Bueller, I said. What if he comes back? <laughs> no chance, he said. I seen him doing a pickle of Mondo at lunchtime with that fat cow for French. What if he does, though, I said. Or what if smell him in grasses in his? Aye, right, he'd be brave, wouldn't he, said Willie. What if he does, though, I said. No more luck. I'd get pure suspended or expelled or something. My life started flashing before my eyes. I could just see it, pure kicked out of our infra, re, infra grammar, then my mouth flinging me out the house on my 16th birthday. Then I end up in a tenement full of dampness next door to the junkies for Paul Berlain and doing some reject college course that can't read Don't Care. It's full of Neds, and I'm not even old enough to leave school yet. Wally talked me into dogging it with him. I was pure bored, and like he said, it was only maths, and really wasn't even in. And then RE, and we'd a substitute teacher anyway. One will go down to Renfra, I said. We sat in the Robbie Park and to the bell goes. It felt dead risky, dead exciting sneaking out of school room, especially when I needed the toilet right at the last minute. Mrs. Oldhill was in there cleaning out sanny bins. What are you up to the day, Kirsty Hen? She said. I feared jump when she said it. I was dying to spill the beans to her, but I was feared she might grass in us, so I just said, nothing. I said, just doing den a pee. My voice went pure high pitched when, when I said it, and she looked at me pure funny. So I just went in and did my business, and I made a sharp exit. I was pure shitting my knickers walking out that gate. I just expected a big horn to clamp itself onto my shoulders and wish me down to Geggy's office. You all right? said Willie. So we're walking down Hanen Road. Aye, fine. Do you know I hate school sometimes? he said. I mean, I know you're smart and you get good marks and all the teachers like you and stuff, but. I hate PE, I said. I don't know why I said it, because I don't really. I just hate Miss Gillis, because she's a cow. No, she's all right, man, said Willie. She's about only teacher in that school, by the way, it's not a two-faced mom. You think so? I know so. See, when we started first year, he said, see nearly every teacher in that high school, as soon as they realised who my family were and who my cousins were, started talking to us different. What do you mean different? Would you think? We both shut up for a few minutes. When we crossed the road at the Robbie Park, we went up and sat in the swings. Different as in talking to you like you're a piece of shite, said Willie. Just because your dad's been in a jail and all your uncles have been in a jail and half your family's been in a jail, he said. It's the same whenever folk fun out I'm a McCoy. They either want to square up to us or avoid us like the plague. I didn't know what to say after that, so I never said anything. And then all this hero shite. Ever since I went and hanged Lindsay Jackson's fingers, he said. Suddenly all the ones that were in the pishing me are like, How you doing, William? Where you going, William? Need a horn to wipe your arse there, William? I didn't mean to, but I started laughing at that. Didn't he say anything about it, though? So he was either no bothered or he hadn't noticed. See that Miss Gillis, he said. She was the only one that never changed towards me. What about me, I said. Do you think I've changed? You're different, Kirsty, he said. I still don't know what he meant by that. He said, see, Miss Gillis, no, the only thing she said to us afterwards, talking to me about pure, pure sprinting down the corridor with Lindsay's finger, what? Wally McCoy, see if I knew you could run like that, I'd have put you in the relay team. We sat there about an hour after that, just talking and stuff. 
And I was telling Wally about this film I saw about this guy that saved a wee lassie's life and then later on he kidnapped somebody else. He couldn't handle being a hero, I said. So what he did was he committed a crime, he balanced himself out. Aye, right you are there, Kirsty. So, well, I'll just go and rob a bank, go hijack a mad aeroplane or something, just so everything goes back to normal. <laughs> yeah, I said, we should both hijack an aeroplane, kidnap Bueller, fly him to like, outer Mongolia or something, and leave him there. You're pure evil, man, pure mental, he said. I thought you were a nice lassie, you know. Shut it, hero, I said. We'd just come out the Robbie Park, and we're stalling at the traffic lights, and this mad car came flying down Paisley Road. I didn't even see it at first because my back to it, but Wally did, and if you ran onto the road and pushed this wee first year boy out the way. I had to phone an ambulance and I was pure shaking. The driver didn't even stop. Paulus came and everything and asked me for a statement. I was about to tell him what happened when Wally butted in and said, this wee guy saved my life. I was like, what? I thought he had a concussion or something, because I scraped the side of his head and his mouth was bleeding. But then he winked at me and then Paulus said, is this true? So I said, aye, I think so, but I didn't really see it. The wee boy, Wally well, saved, didn't say anything to correct him. I think he was in shock. End up, he's broke his collarbone in two places when I hit the ground. See this wee guy? Wally well, said to the police and the folk that were stonering about, he's a hero, by the way. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Eli. We coming of age piece, it's always brilliant. It's funny how when we think of our communities and stuff, we always think it in past tense as well. Um, I'd like to perform a poem about an absolute linchpin in my community. Um, it's Lynch's Bar on the London Road. <coughs> if you've been there, you will know. So I'm in Lynch's, I Lynch's, I Lynch's. You know Lynch's, I, I know Lynch's. So anyway, He's stoning at the bar in these bogging hippie trousers like he's been on some gap year. And he's shat himself in the flight home. And lynches. I lynches. You know lynches? I know lynches. And he's like, I'm sorry. Do you have the Wi-Fi password? And lynches. I, you know lynches. I fucking know lynches. So I says, mate. My pal leans up to me. This binge drinking dentist, eyebrows poised to extract molars for disbelieving mouths, a pound rattles some Aztec Jap camera for the jukebox up ahead. But it's just me and him, rough and rotten, and a stout and formica stench. And he says, <coughs> So I says, Mate, you must be fucking lost. Thank you. Lynch's is actually a brilliant pub, by the way. Um, it doesn't need Wi-Fi. <laughs> so, uh, in a more serious note, when I think uh, my community, I always think it's, it's diverse. The stories in it are diverse. It's went for being quite like Paisley, actually, really busy and sort of industrial and bustling with incomers, almost like, because I live in a port city, I'm from Glasgow, Paisley's the same, loads of people coming up and down through the mills and things like that. And I always think of the, all the different diasporas it takes to make a city what it is. And I think very much about the kind of Irish families that settled in Glasgow over the past maybe 150 years and the impact they made and what life was like for them. Um, and during lockdown, I became really kind of rattled about sort of living in an urban setting. I started to think, I'm not meant to be here, I'm meant to be by the sea, there's merit to this. There's, there's something out there that I now can't reach because I'm, I'm trapped in this city that my family moved to generations ago. So I'm going to do a wee kind of a triptych of poetry about that, if that's a thing. By the crimson dawn shake, he ran. Come on, die young, sprayed by aluminium cans and a Molotov bat bottle smashed at daybreak. There's a bin spill by a cotton mill, a tick 
talk of a clock set fast, mass clad, Sunday mass. The red flag flaps the flyover by morning wake. And at dawn, she pulled him out himself, this neck tight sweat break. And he sat bare backed in Clyde made, and he cried, This city, a heartache. Because it'll be slum, it will be murdered as they slumber there in silent spies lying everywhere around us. Now I dreamt that we were in the Geltach. Wet wax hood over windswept heads, peat intense nostrils crept, cheeks embered would climb whitewashed steps and sleep, a wooden chair and a cotton bed. Now I dreamt we were in the Gelta, perched in dune-built sands, pink nicotine drawn through knobbled hands and the sun burning orange on your skin where it lands, just us and some cans in the Atlantic. You see, my mother's hobbled on board. They left their tongues on these ivory shores, their hidden past lives, forgotten lores. And they chored nine days a week in this country's concrete. And now this city reeks of the dead. There's walls closing in and there's no promise left. It's filmed in every camera and grassed up on every close end. And I no longer love her. So maybe it's time to go home. Because a thousand flood burst the banks of the Clyde each day of 1848 had it not been a people. Where the undead sailed in coffins for dairy and Irish fever spilled for the foil to boil the banks with typhoid and the young scratched with fleas for starving rats to be sacked and abandoned in Scotland's slums and they were feared and they were greeted by no one. So when my family arrived in Scotland, they didn't flee famine nor civil war. Civil war. Their guilt was already black with Angorta more. Their names were warning signs on windows. Then no work or trade gave way to forgotten faiths and altered names and just tags of terrier, terrorist, and take. And coffins are no made of mahogany today, they're tarpaulin and waves, no Kilkenny's mass graves, but the beds of the Aegean Sea. The road for Damascus stacked with similarities even Saul could see. Flotsam children line beaches, their flesh all bloated and grey like typhus. Their parents' skeleton faces line security gates and fences with wires poked with frail famine hands and lips stitched and stomach pitted as Joe McDonnell or Bobby Sands. They may want me to say that they're no like us and they don't belong like us. I can never forget that my Scotland is cut free refugees. Know how I'm privileged because my sister's made a journey for me. So as a child, I watched for couch and TV, miles for pipe bombs and peace walls and I will not fall silent. I'll stand tall and I'll stand proud and I'll stand in solidarity with every displaced person now residing in Scotland. So are we ready to welcome our offers back onto the stage then? Yeah. Right, for God's sake, man! Right, there we go. Can we please welcome back the fantastic Eli Percy? Thank you very much. So I've never read this story before aloud to an audience. <laughs> um, I, only, um, I only wrote it last year. Um, and when I was asked to do this festival and we we're talking about community, I thought, well, there's no community without the lack of community, the, the isolation that some people feel because they don't feel part of stuff. Um, so I wanted to read this story, which is a sci-fi story. Um, and it's, it's really about isolation. Um, yeah, I think as a, as a neurodivergent person, I've often felt like I didn't really fit in, or I'd find a space and I'd almost fit in, but then 
just something, something was missing. Um, and I know I've spoken to other neurodivergent people who, who feel the same. Um, so I, I wrote this story um, for Shoreline of Infinity, um, the, the disabled and um, neurodivergent issue uh, that came out in November and it's called The Alien Invasion. I was abducted by aliens once. Never told anyone, but it's nearly 40 years ago and I knew what folk would say. The ones in my class would be all, the GI? Is that when you had your first anal probe? Is that why you're a fucking space cadet? Probably would have thought I was just making it up for attention anyway. My ma definitely would. That's what he's trying to say that time I smacked my head after the living room wall after my dad shoved me out the road to the telly. Try to say there was nothing up with me. That was just pure at it. Try to get an extra time off school. Fair play, I did have previous. The bit of bother I've missed or really the math teacher, because I twice get caught jog dog in his tutorials. You still think someday would have took me to hospital though? I told them umpteen times I was feeling weird. That massive big bruise in the side of my noggin. But no, my ma was like, oh, you'll be fine once you've had an early night. My dad was just put out because he knew he'd have to forego watching the rest of his Channel 4 darts tournament. Aye, that will be right, he wrote. I'm no traipsing all the way to the Southern General for you, you melodramatic wee shite. Know that my dad ever did anything to strain his cell. He'd never worked since he'd left the John Nielsen. And his greatest claim for a feather was the story of how he used to take us to this Buck Rogers restaurant in Glasgow when I was away. You wanted to see the inside of this gaff, he'd say whenever he'd an audience. So I'd done up like a spaceship. Pure brilliant, so it was. And the food was served by actual robots. And the real waitresses were all dressed up as aliens. According to my da, I pure loved it. And I greet the face of having to go any time we're up the tune. I don't remember any of this, by the way. What I do remember is getting took to some clatty burger place where the flares were all sticky and there was hardly any light. I get parked in front of a big projector screen that played reruns of the same shitey TV show, week in, week out. What's he get pissed with his pals at the bar? When my parents finally phoned an ambulance for us. It was a full two days later. And only because I took a mad seizure, I was helping my ma prepare the torties for her Sunday dinner. Oh, it was horrible to see, she said. You're in the flare for jerking away good still, holding on to the peeler. You end up taking a big scliff of skin off your chin. Aye, horrible, mumbled my dad. He'd missed the full drama because he'd been watching V, the final battle. My dad used to be heavy into all the old sci-fi programs, Star Trek, Mork and Mindy, you name it. V was his favourite though. He'd all the episodes on Betamax. He also did a signed photo of Jane Badler, aka Diana, the evil visitor, that was his pure pride and joy. After I had my head injury, he started asking me to sit and watch his programmes with him. I wasn't really interested, especially since it was a constant headache and I couldn't concentrate on anything for more than a few seconds. But I didn't want to upset him, so I just did it. I knew he felt bad about what he'd done to me. Doctors said I had a fractured skull and it takes six months to heal, but luckily they didn't think I'd have um, invasive surgery. They also said I'd probably always be left with slight brain damage. My dad didn't actually apologise as such. But he chucked the bevy all together and never once did he lift his horn to me again. You're probably wondering by now what this is going to do with an alien abduction. I like to think that everything happens for a reason. And the only reason it happened to me, because I was dog in school the day that the aliens appeared. I'd been sent to see this educational psychologist, you see. Can't mind exactly when. A month later, two months possibly more. Doctor said I was suffering from both post-traumatic and anterograde amnesia, as well as other things. Imagine having two amnesias. Fucking no luck at all. Eh? Anyway, this psychologist came into school. She was one nosy bastard, by the way. We were asking a million questions about how did I find my school working? How was I getting on with my teachers and other ones in my class? No, I might not be a brain of Britain, but I'm not that fucking stupid. I knew if I said anything about the ones in my class that laughed and slapped their horns at me, or the teaching staff who looked the other way, my life wouldn't be worth living. So I told her everything was fine. 
I told her I forgot stuff sometimes and I gave her a few examples of me being a pure idiot. And she seemed quite happy at that. Then, on the morning at the second psychology appointment, I did what I always used to do whenever I didn't want to go to school. Kid it on, I wasn't well. My ma went out to her cleaning job, my dad went down to the bookies, and I snuck out to the Robbie Park. See, to be honest, I can't mind much about that day. I was feeling a wee bit wabbit, and it started to piss the rain. And one minute, I was at the animals' corner, feeding bits of plain breed to Sally the goat. The next, there was a mad flying saucer boiling above my head. You'd think somebody else would have seen a spaceship a lighting on the roof of the hen house. Apparently no, though. Wasn't it what you'd call a subtle entrance, either? <laughs> we all the squawking and the shrieking. To be fair, it wasn't a very big spaceship. About the size of your living room. It was a right brief morning, and there weren't much folk about. But still, I had this sudden blinding headache right as I was looking up at the thing, followed by another one of these stupid fits. When I woke up, I was lying in a gurney and wearing what looked like a metal colander around my napper. No, I know what you're probably thinking. You're thinking brain injury equals fucking do lally. Aye, maybe you're right. Maybe I'm not an extra special terrestrial, a weirdo, a query like all the cunts for school used to say. Maybe I don't know every single detail of what happened to me that day, but I'm 100% that they were real aliens I saw, and that the aliens saved my life. I felt much better after the aliens unclamped the mad colander from an apper and beamed me back down to street level. I still couldn't concentrate great, and my memory was the same as Swiss cheese, but the dizziness and the nausea and the constant pounding I'd had in the back of my skull for months was totally gone. See, my dad came out the bookies. He found me sitting in a wall round the back of the Renfrew Town Hall. And I bought a Strike Cola, three big pickles, and a bag of chips for Dominic's. Also, had no clue how I'd got there or what had enabled me to pay for a chippy. Not long after that, I went for a folly up at the hospital. <laughs> that was when all the palaver ensued between the different doctors, because none of them could find any trace of a skull fracture with their mad machines. They did two mere CT scans plus an MRI, but it was still nada. In the end, they decided that obviously being a mix-up with a first x-ray, and there was never any damage to my head at all. I did think about telling the doctors that I'd been abducted by aliens. <laughs> but I knew that'd be a big mistake. I could just imagine myself being weaked off to some random laboratory for further tests. Probably some wee snide orderly would tell the papers and my full family would end up in the news of the world. <laughs> so I kept it buttoned. I got home in my life. My memory never got any better. School remained shite. But I learnt to live with deficits. An educational psychologist who turned out to actually be quite nice continued to request me every Monday morning for the rest of the year, which got me out of tutorial maths. Things at home were much the same. My ma was still my ma. She never listened to a word I said. My dad was still a bit of a dick. But him and me got on a lot better. And there was one other good thing that came out of all this. I realised I actually quite like my dad's alien invasion programmes. Thank you. Can we please? Um, yeah, I just want to say, because I'm not going to come back up now, uh, just thank you for tonight, and thank you for being such a warm audience. And thank you to both the readers tonight, Darren and Eli, for sharing their stories. And I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the festival. There's loads of great stuff on over the week and loads of kind of community stuff. So please do come. And yeah, I'd like to invite back to the stage Mr. Dan McGarvey. Thank you. I do feel that Victoria's been very charitable in her appraisal of the audience's warmth. Yeah. <laughs> I feel you've been a little small c conservative with your appreciation personally. Um, okay, this is the second half of the, the preface and it's a wee bit longer than the first one but I'll get through it. 
uh, as quick as I can. I no longer suffer financial insecurity, not like I used to. If I ever worry about money, it's only because I have become accustomed to its consistent supply. Even when things feel tighter, opportunities and support are just a phone call or an email away. I'm healthier, happier. My horizons have broadened. My children enjoy a quality of life that I never had. I've turned down more opportunities in the last few years than most people are offered in a lifetime. And even when adversity strikes, I possess the material and emotional resources to absorb or mitigate it, not simply for myself, but also for people I love and care about. The year preceding the pandemic was perhaps my first real glimpse into the parallel universe inhabited by those who travel in the first class carriage of British society. I have tasted that comfort, legitimacy and prosperity and to my surprise and occasional shame have grown to rather enjoy it. Still, the degree of separation from poverty and hardship remains slight. I can never be truly middle class because the vast majority of my social connections, family, friends and acquaintances still inhabit that world from which I have been temporarily spared. That world where one misstep can turn your life upside down. People I know and love continue to suffer great difficulties. Family and friends have been laid off, returned to prison, fallen into the nightmarish torment of addiction and alcoholism, been struck with ill health, both mental and physical, and become homeless. Some have even perished by accident or by suicide. Like many of you, I do my best to support people and causes I care about, but every act of compassion and generosity seems somehow undermined, not by the inability of those struggling to lift themselves up, but by a society comprised of systems, processes and institutional cultures which push them down and hold them there in spite of their best efforts. A society which is so keen to cater to the needs, aspirations and assumptions of the well-to-do that those at the bottom have begun to suffer even more acutely than usual. Given my recent good fortune, I remain all too aware that I may no longer be capable, try as I might, of authentically channeling the struggles faced by increasing numbers of individuals, families and communities. I am also very conscious that I lack any formal academic training and I am not the most learned person. Then again, knowing very little appears no obstacle for politicians and commentators who are either toxifying my news feeds with their puerile observations or being paraded on my television screen day by day, broadcasting their ignorance. I feel that the three year period throughout which I have been largely insulated from poverty has already blunted my senses and narrowed my field of vision. Though I remain hopeful that if a certain Eric Blair, who adopted the alias of George Orwell in an attempt to purge his Etonian heritage was able to shed some much needed light on the issue of inequality, poverty and class in Britain, then I, someone who has lived it, may yet purge my survivor's guilt by contributing something of value to the ongoing debate. In my debut book, Poverty Safari, I attempted to animate much of the data around the impacts of social deprivation by sharing my own experience of growing up in an alcoholic home in the 80s and 90s. In a desperate attempt to eschew the pitfalls of a standard misery memoir, my lived experience acted instead as a Trojan horse, smuggling in social commentary and political analysis wherever I deemed it relevant to lend some context to the behaviours, attitudes and adversities so often associated with working class life. It was not written with the intention of becoming commercially or critically successful. It was aimed mainly at local left-wingers and charities. But its chaotic publication in 2017 quickly altered the course of my life. I effectively became middle class overnight, on paper at least. 
There are few things more ironic than becoming financially comfortable off the back of a book you wrote about poverty. Despite the perks, there looms an unspoken but palpable threat. This prosperity, my prosperity, is conditional. That the opportunities and security I enjoy depend upon my willingness to play the role I have been designated. The diamond in the rough who talks about poverty. And this may be withdrawn should I fail to conform to the prevailing attitude that Britain, despite its imperfections, is a fundamentally just country, something I do not believe. Yet, the gravity of the centre ground bears down upon me. How easy it would be to chalk my radical beliefs up to immaturity and use my children as an airtight justification for taking everything I can get like so many have done before me. Maybe I will at some point, but not this year. Given that I have been commended so frequently by the great book buying public over the last few years for my brutal, harrowing, unflinchingly honest accounts of poverty and social inequality, a mischievous part of me wonders how middle class readers might respond to becoming the subject of my analysis as opposed to the poor and the downtrodden? Would they, having subjected themselves to sustained criticism, still find me fair-minded, even-handed and magnanimous, as they have my musings on the working classes? Or is their generosity contingent on my serving up a gritty, but in the end feel-good, lived experience page-turner, which does not disturb their moderate sensibilities? I've spent the last two years travelling the country, attending events, making documentary films and appearing on television panel shows. I've gone from living on a relatively modest, often low income, to being in the top 9% of earners in the UK. The financial security of my family is now frighteningly dependent on appealing to what I regard as Britain's prevailing middle class consensus. It has therefore suddenly become counterintuitive to say or write anything that may offend, insult or antagonise this most lucrative demographic, though this concern has not yet been overpowered completely by my immutable sense that something is very wrong with our society. I've spoken in packed venues across the country, performed my own one-man shows at the Edinburgh Fringe, been paid a month's wages for one hour's work and felt the seductive draw of fame. I've bathed in rooftop jacuzzis, stayed in plush hotels with complimentary umbrellas and endless mood lighting configurations. My life has changed immeasurably to the extent that merely speaking factually about it may sound to some like I am insensitively tooting my own horn. But even when I get temporarily drunk on an inevitable delusion of grandeur and overestimate both my importance and ability, I have still not strayed far from the world I left behind. Things have gone well for me, but my view into that other world remains largely unobstructed. I've sat on cold pavements in the bitter winter with beggars, asking them why they would rather wander the streets than live in supported accommodation. I've pleaded with alcoholics with wet brain to give sobriety one last shot before they end up dead and read their obituaries in the papers weeks later. I've stood in a freezing flat with a single mother as she read me the GP letter, confirming the dampness and the cold in a council-provided temporary accommodation was causing her one-year-old's respiratory problems. I've walked a frosty cemetery with a recovering heroin addict as she laid flowers at the graves of her entire family who perished from drug overdoses and who are mostly buried in paupers' graves because she can't afford the headstones. I've wandered the back streets of popular English seaside towns in the richest county in the UK and found living conditions unworthy of dogs, where poor governance and not immigrants represents the singular threat to local culture and social cohesion. I've sat with youth workers at their wits' end as diversionary services are cut amid a surge in gang and knife violence, walked with prison wardens who know the criminal justice system is broken 
and spoken to officers in the probation services who could have told you five years ago that privatising it would only create more social and financial costs down the line. I've chased down councillors to get vulnerable women pondering sex work as a means of survival and to save for accommodation and even, perhaps unethically, threatened one local authority that if they did not locate suitable accommodation for a young man who was suicidal, I would go after them the next day in the paper. And I've sat in utter heartbroken disbelief as a man with Tourette syndrome and serious mental health problems, grieving the loss of his friends to suicide, began convulsing on the floor after I asked him about what it's like to go through the DWP's personal independence payment assessment. Sadly, too many in my tax bracket only bear witness to this nightmarish social reality through the media they consume, if they even glimpse it at all. They remain so far from the action that even where they would earnestly wish to bring about change, they often don't know where to start. Post-industrial Britain is in the grip of a feverish malaise. A ravine cuts through us, partitioning winners from losers, the powerful from the powerless, the vocal from the voiceless, the deserving from the undeserving. I find myself caught in the middle between a simpler existence where all I need to care about is my own family and securing the quality of life and the world I have only just escaped, characterised by ill health, social deprivation and a dangerous dearth of opportunity. The irony of making a few quid from writing a book about poverty is not yet lost on me. Nor is the fact that in that love letter to Britain's underclass, I cautioned those on the sharp end of poverty against unrestrained and toxic anger, when the truth is, I have never been more furious than I am right now. If brutal, harrowing, unflinch, unflinching honesty is what you want, then that is exactly what you're going to get. Thanks very much, everyone. Great night. <laughs>